right, we're here in John chapter 21, and the name of this sermon as we're finishing up the book of John is how to encourage a backslidden soul winner. How to encourage a backslidden soul winner. This is a really interesting topic that really this chapter focuses on. And let me say this, that this is an important sermon for all of us, and if you one day do get backslidden, the sad reality is you're probably not going to remember this sermon because these things are going to fade out. But if you know someone who has gotten backslidden that you're a friend with, you know, this is something you can encourage them and show them what the Bible says. Because what we're seeing in this chapter is that Peter and all the disciples are completely backslidden. And they have forsaken so many. They've just kind of given up the fight. And yet, at the very end, they're very encouraging. And so we're going to see why that is. We're going to go verse by verse here. And it says in verse number one, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. And so he's showing them again. So this is not the first time after he's risen again that he's come to the disciples. You would think that when they saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, they would immediately just be back into it. That is not what took place. He shows himself to them, and you know, they realize it's him, and they want to start living for God, and yet they don't start living for God. You say, why is that? Well, let me give you a logical explanation of this. And see, the Bible talks about, you know, basically climbing a mountain to get close to God. You know, we see the analogy in in Exodus 34, I believe it is, where Moses is climbing a mountain to get close to God. And he's given very simple instructions of what he needs to do. They're not very easy to do, but it's simple to understand what he needs to do. And he gets to the very top, and then afterwards he's with, with the Lord for a while. And then he comes back, and he actually is physically changed. And the people don't recognize him. So basically it's symbolic of someone getting close to God. Okay? But I want you to think about climbing a mountain. Okay? It, what do you think is faster, to climb a mountain or to fall down a mountain? What's going to take more time to climb a mountain? Isn't that true? I mean, you fight and fight and fight. But what if, you know, have you ever been climbing a mountain and you grab a hold of, like, roots that are in the ground and you think it's really solid and then it just pulls up right out of the ground and then you tumble down the hill or tumble down the mountain? That's happened to me before. I remember I spent about an hour climbing up this really steep hill with my friend. I get near the top. And then I grab onto these things that I thought were rooted into the ground, and it just pulls out of the ground and I just go tumbling down the hill. Now, it doesn't take long to fly down the hill, but quite honestly, it takes a while to climb up a hill. And what you have to understand is when your momentum starts going down and you start backsliding, why do you think we get this phrase? It's like you're sliding down a mountain. You're backsliding. It's very hard to stop and get your momentum going forward. It's not that easy. It's very easy to live for God when things are going well. You're reading the Bible. You're going soul winning. It's really easy. Man, nothing can stop me. But if you fall into some sin or something happens in your life, you start to backslide a little bit. And it's just very hard to stop yourself and get going again. And that is what we see with them, where they are living for God, very devoted. They get depressed. And even though they see the risen Christ, they're backsliding and they cannot stop. They just keep backsliding, even though they've already seen the risen Christ. And so in this chapter, this is kind of how he like shakes them out of it. But they basically are backsliding, and they cannot stop. Now, the sad reality is that this is Peter. This is one of the greatest men who ever lived. Yeah. And if this could happen to Peter, then I promise you it could happen to one of us. I mean, Peter literally sees the risen Christ, and yet that doesn't shake him out of it. For us, if we start backsliding, we're not going to see the risen Christ. And if, if you do see the risen Christ, you got both problems in this backsliding. <laughs> you either got a problem with drug us or, or you got a little bit of a Pentecostal problem there. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, this, that does not shake Peter out of it. He's backsliding and he cannot stop himself, okay? You have to realize you do not want your momentum to be going backwards. You must just be every day faithfully just reading your Bible, doing your prayer time. And you might think, oh, I'm just skipping a little while. It's not that big of a deal. I'm busy. But once you start getting your momentum going backwards, you could just keep falling backwards and not be able to, to start again. Just think logically in a day. Let's say you have a day where you're not really living for God. The day just got started off rough. You woke up late. didn't have a chance to read the Bible. You're just kind of in a bad mood because you haven't really been serving God that day. you know. And then isn't it pretty hard to just stop and at the end of the day just say, I'm going to read my Bible for two hours. It usually doesn't work that way. Right. When your momentum's going back in a day, you usually have to stop until the next day to really start living for God. And from a logical perspective, it's kind of like at the start of a day, you're basically not moving. Okay, this is what you need to understand. But you're facing uphill to a mountain. Okay? This is kind of the analogy God's giving. Basically, you're stopped at the start of a new day. So whether or not yesterday you went solely for five hours and then got eight people saved, 
you've read the Bible for hours, but whether or not you commit, you got drunk the day, you're still at a stopping point at the start of the next day. Yeah. And so you must start your momentum every single day, get it going forward. Now, if you've ever seen a car that is, I know there's not really hills here in the Philippines, but you know, back in West Virginia in the mountain state, you know, we have hills and mountains, and you'll see a car that will get stopped on a hill. And you know, it's really hard to, to get that car going. But you know, once it gets into momentum, it's very easy to get it to go. You just gotta push, push, like four or five people will push it, push it, it'll be stopped. Then all of a sudden it gets going and then it's fine. It's kind of the same thing in a Christian life. You know, you must start the day for God, and it takes a little bit of emphasis to get it going. And once you start living for God, it's a lot easier. But once you're in this perpetual state of backsliding, each and every day you just don't feel like reading the Bible, you don't feel like praying. You just, it's really hard. It's like, for example, if you know you're someone who runs a lot. Has anyone here, in here ever done a lot of running? Anybody? No. Yeah. When you run a lot, think about when you take a break from running for a week or so. You're not as good at running anymore. Isn't it pretty frustrating to retread the ground that you used to be able to do? I mean, it's frustrating when, when it's just like, man, I'm working out, but I'm not as fast as I used to be. I'm not as strong as I used to be. It's very difficult. And see, that's what's happening with Peter and the disciples. They have to now retread the same mountain that they've already climbed up because they've fallen down that mountain in the wrong ways. It's very hard. So how do you how do you encourage a backslidden slider, backslidden solar? How do you get him back in the fight? Well, let's notice what it says in verse 2. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with him. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. And so Simon Peter says, you know what? I'm going to go fishing. What does everybody else do? Hey, let's go fishing as well. Now, look, we obviously know that Peter was not the first pope. But I will say that Peter was kind of the leader of these early Christians. That's the reason why they say, well, it's Peter. You know, when obviously they didn't believe in the pope. But what I'm saying here is that Simon Peter is kind of the leader. Because when he decides to backslide, everyone's like, I'm going to backslide too. And what you have to realize in this room, that if you're somebody that people look up to as, as kind of a leader in our church or someone who's really serving God, if you quit, you're probably not the only one who's going to quit. Right. There's probably going to be other people that follow you. And at the very least, you're going to discourage people that were in this church and faithful. I've seen it many times in my life where somebody leaves a church, they get backslidden, and when they get backslidden, other people are just like, man, you know, I don't know if I can keep going anymore. And then other people sometimes leave the church once one person falls. You have to understand the importance that you have in this, this room. And the reality is, from the people that are in this room right now, all of you are considered leaders in our church. All of you are considered people that are very faithful. And if you fade out of church one day, you're going to affect other people as well. Right. And our lives are not about us. It's about other people. So even if you get mad at me, and you know, I preach that one thing you're really offended by, you know, I, I can't think of anything that would really offend you guys. I'll think of something though. I really offend somebody in this room, and you know what? You get really mad at me or whatever. Look, you have to realize that even if you get mad at me, if you leave this church, you're going to affect other people, and you want them to fall as well. That's not what's happening with people. But notice, as he's going back to his old lifestyle, they catch nothing. You say, why? Well, I mean, because God's obviously not blessing them. You see, before they met the Lord to begin with, they're just kind of hardworking people. They're fishermen. But basically, you know, God specifically wanted to use Peter and these other disciples. These are his closest people. He wanted to use them to really be devoted to the Lord, to start churches, to preach sermons, and things such as that. And so he doesn't want them to be fishing. It'd be like if somebody was a pastor or an evangelist, and they just decided, you know what, I've had enough. I don't want to do it anymore. Here's, here's the thing. If God wants you to be a pastor, he wants you to be an evangelist, and you just kind of turn it, if you just pull a Jonah on God, <laughs> what's going to happen to you? God's not going to be happy with you, right? okay? And they're catching nothing. You say, why? Well, God's not blessing them. And it doesn't matter how good your job is if you don't have God's blessing. It really is kind of meaningless. Verse number four. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. He said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. Notice how they're able to catch nothing. They're clearly backslidden. They're really doing nothing for God in their lives. And now all of a sudden they have a great multitude of fishes. You say, what is the Lord trying to teach them? Well, he's not really trying to teach them about literal fish. He's not talking about the son of Okay, 
He's talking about Isan Kalagur. Right. He's talking about the soul, getting soul saved, soul winning. Because we're fishers of men. Right. So he's reminding them. They don't realize it's Jesus, and all of a sudden they get a great multitude of fishes, and immediately, immediately, it reminds them. Okay? A great multitude of fish, right? Fish is, I think the plural of fish is fish. Sorry about that. But anyways, let me see. Verse number seven. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat on him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Now, let me just say that there's a lot of confusion about this verse. You know, the Bible says that, that Simon Peter was naked. Okay? Now, if you understand what the Bible speaks about when it talks about nakedness, it's not just saying you're fully naked. Okay? Look, Peter was not fully naked. Right? He was not fishing with zero clothes on. Okay? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Right. Okay. Of course he's not going to do that. For one, none of his friends would want to be around. <laughs> he was fishing with, with absolutely no clothes on. So you say, how was he fishing? Well, turn to Exodus 28. Exodus 28. Now see, here's, here's something that the world has a double standard on. They have a double standard on what nakedness is. Yes. Because see, the world will say, well, you know what? If, if you're not wearing any clothes, you're naked, which I agree with. But, you know, they'll, they'll, depending on who you talk to, they'll say that if you go to the beach with, you know, um, you know, bathing suit, that you're not naked at the beach. But if you wore that same clothing inside of a church building, you're naked. Isn't that what the world would say? Right. You come in here, they say, we're not letting you in. You're naked. This is the house of God. But yet you can go to the beach and wear a swimsuit, and it's not naked. Now, how does that work? <laughs> how does it that God changes the standards depending on what location you're in? So tell me, what is the standard of when it's okay to wear a bathing suit? What's the standard? And see, the world standard doesn't really make sense. Because if you ask the average person, you know, is this nakedness, people would vary on their opinion depending on how much skin you're showing. Some people would say, well, it's nakedness if your shirt goes to here. Some would say if it's here. Look, there's no real standard. Right. People don't have a standard. They don't even know what their standard is. Some people think that it would be, be you know, there's just completely different standards. But see, Obviously, on topics like these, the Bible's going to give us the answer. Right. And what does it say in Exodus 28, verse 42? And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. And see, the Bible says your nakedness from the loins, even unto the thighs. Look, it's not saying from the loins to the top of the thighs, because that's no area whatsoever. It's saying from the loins, your waist area, to the bottom of your thighs, to your knees. Okay? This is nakedness according to the Bible. Look, we have to have a standard of what's naked and what's not naked. If there is no standard, people won't know. Right. God has a standard. You say, but that can't be nakedness, Brother Stuckey, because I walk outside, it means everybody's naked. Yeah, when you walk outside, <laughs> yeah. pretty much every girl walking around is naked according to the Bible. Right. Look, I didn't write the Bible. That's just the reality that we have today. Yep. And look, as I've said before, when it comes to preachers from the past, they would preach against going to the beach because they said you don't want to be around just a bunch of people that are naked. But see, nowadays, good night, man, you can't even step outside. There's like no area you can go to where you're avoiding seeing people that are naked according to the Bible. Right. Now, this goes for both men and women. It doesn't say, well, if you're a woman and this area is exposed, you're naked. No, it's whether you're a man or a woman. Quite honestly, we're talking about linen bridges. We're talking about a guy, but it applies to both men and women. So whether you're a guy showing up with thigh or whether you're a lady showing up with thigh, it's naked according to the Bible. Now let me say this. I do my very best. I mean, I, I never show off my nakedness when I'm outside of my house. Like if I take out the trash just 10 feet outside of, of where we go is where we dump the trash, I always make sure that I'm completely covered up, that nothing in me Say why? Well, for one, I'm married, and you owe that to your spouse. But for two, you're naked according to the Bible if you're showing your thigh. Right. And I'm not going to do that. See, the Bible is very clear here in Exodus 28, verse 42. Now, see, the world standard is not very clear at all, though. Ask people out there, hey, what's naked? They're not going to tell you it's naked if they're wearing a mini skirt to here. You say, why? Because that's what they're wearing when you ask them the question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember hearing a sermon a long time ago. The first sermon I heard from Jack Hiles was called Mini Skirts in Light of the Bible. Okay? Now, let me say a few things about this sermon, because it's been 15 years since I heard this sermon. But I remember the first time when I heard that sermon, I thought he was a little bit crazy. And I'll tell you why. Because I went to college at the time, and when you see it all the time, you think, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. 
because that's too strict. I was like, why is he so, why does he care so much about how people are dressed? I, I listened to it because it was a curious idol, but I was just like, it seems, it seems too intense. I mean, big deal. Let women dress how they want. But see, that's what happens when you're around the world. You get right. brainwashed. You start not realizing how important things like that are. Now look, when you're a married person, or when you're dating someone, obviously you wouldn't care about that. You don't want somebody lusting after your spouse. And so, you know, what the, what the Bible says, though, is nakedness is if your thighs are exposed. That sort of preaching you're never even going to hear in churches anymore. Right. You won't even hear a Baptist pastor say anything against wearing miniskirts anymore. You say, why? Because many of his members probably wear miniskirts outside mm -hmm. of the time. That's the reality. And so what it says next is 28 verse 42. It says your nakedness is when your thighs are exposed. Now go back to John 21. So what was Simon Peter wearing? Well, according to the Bible, he was naked. And I can promise you he's not 100% naked. He is wearing some clothes. And, you know, honestly, the most likely thing is the fact that his thigh was exposed, that he was wearing shorts. Because the Bible specifically says that that is nakedness to have. Obviously, he's not going to have other areas that would be considered naked exposed. Okay? It's probably his thigh. Now, you say, well, what about if he was not wearing a shirt? I don't know of a verse that would specifically say that if a guy doesn't wear a shirt, that it's naked. I will say this, though. I think it's immodest, though, for yeah. a guy to walk around without a shirt on. I don't think it's naked, and I'm not even necessarily arguing it's a sin, but I'll tell you this. I'm not going to walk around without my shirt on. Mm -hmm. Look, when I was in college, you know, I was a lot younger at the time. I remember because, as I've said before, I have very pale skin, and I remember I was like, man, I'm going to the beach this summer, and I went running a lot, so I'd go running without my shirt on. Okay, it was a long time ago. But, you know, I, I don't believe that's very modest. Looking at what I believe the Bible says now, I don't think that's right for a guy to do. Is it naked? It might not be naked, but it's not very modest. You say, why? Because, you know, it can cause women to look at you or whatever. Look, you know, you, you, ought, to, you ought to cover up. And that goes for both men and women. Right. Even if it's not naked, you know, you want to be modest. And so, you know, this could go with, like, women wearing really tight clothes. It's like, well, how modest is that? Are you still showing off your body even though you're covering up your thigh in certain areas? Look, we ought to dress and try to be modest, okay? And so whether you're a guy or a girl, the way you dress, you should be modest. You know, when you're outside of your home, now it's different if you're just around your, your, your wife or whatever, or if you're a single guy or you're in a room by yourself or whatever, you know, fine. But if you're going out in public, you shouldn't be running around without your shirt on. Right. It's not modest. Now, some people could disagree with me on that, but you know what? That's not something that I would do. Now, turn to, turn back to John 21. As I said, you know, I used to run without a shirt on, but honestly, that's not something I do now. When I go swimming, I wear a shirt. I don't go without a shirt. Now, somebody could disagree with me on that standard, but you know what? That is my standard, and that's the standard I keep to. If, I'm a, if I go swimming somewhere, then you know what? I make sure I wear a shirt. That's what I did. When, when I went to the beach last year in North Carolina with my family, it was a very secluded time of year. When I went out to the ocean, you know, I had a shirt on. And, you know, there weren't a whole lot of people there, but I remember people just thinking it's kind of weird. But it's like, well, I guess I'm a peculiar person in the world's eyes. But I want to be modest. And I believe that's – now, that might not be your standard. You might say, I don't agree with you, and that's fine. But you need to find out what your standard is, and you need to hold to that standard. Now, the standard of nakedness is not hard to figure out because the Bible says that if the thigh is exposed, you know, then that's naked. Whatever standard of modesty is, you should hold to that no matter what the world is. Right. See, the world could mock you and think you're too extreme. But the world mocks us for so much anyway. Yeah. Who cares what the world says? You know, we didn't know what our standard is, even if people think that we're too extreme. John chapter 21, verse 8. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all they were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 1. And so 153 fishes, and this is, um, you know, obviously pretty big fish. It says great fishes. And in Matthew 13, starting at verse 47, the Bible reads, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net 
You're basically putting it out there and you're catching whatever comes in. Right. Okay? That is what we ought to do. We go soul winning, we throw out that net to anyone who will listen, if they're worthy according to the Bible. But when you throw out that net, I want you to notice what it says in verse number 48, that you're going to get some good and you're going to get some bad. And the bad, you cast away. What is it talking about about the bad? Well, it's basically talking about someone who's a phony, a false prophet, someone who didn't get saved, and someone who ends up just causing problems in the church. And you say, well, I, I want to avoid that. Well, then just don't do any soul winning. You'll never bring anybody back to church. But if you're bringing people to church and going soul winning, you're going to have a mix of both good and bad. Yes. That's what the Bible says. Now, let me give you a couple stories of, that I know of, of examples where you caught something bad. Okay? A friend of mine, actually, Brother Richie, Brother Richard Sines, I remember there was someone he brought to church in West Virginia. And both of these people in these stories are named Joe. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe be careful if you know somebody named Joe wants to come to church. I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, Richie brought this guy named Joe. And so he brought him in. Immediately, this guy wanted to kind of hang out with us and fellowship with us. The guy was, was different. You know people that are kind of weird, but you feel guilty about thinking that. They're just kind of strange, and you're like, I don't know about this person. But you feel guilty because you feel like, you know, we ought to love everyone. He's a Christian brother. He just had this weird look in his eyes. You know, some people, people times people just have a weird look. He just acted kind of effeminate, too, and everything. And Richie was giving him a ride to church. Now, Richie's story about this guy was that he gave him the gospel, and the guy did not get saved when Richie was there, but the guy basically told Richie he got saved that night. He was thinking about it, and he prayed and got saved later on. Okay? Now, that's not crazy, because sometimes that happens. You hear it, but you don't immediately get saved. You know, it takes you a little bit of time, maybe. I know a lot of people that heard the gospel, and it wasn't immediately there. The seed was there, and they knew, and then they thought about it, and they got saved. Well, this person, Joe, though, he was kind of weird. Richie told us, you know, yeah, you know, I don't know if I want to keep giving this guy a ride to church and everything like that. He said, I don't know, it's just kind of strange. And so I remember I was, basically he wasn't going to give him a ride anymore. And, and this guy was texting me because he had my number. And obviously me. he's like, oh, Richie won't give me a ride anymore. And so I was thinking, if this guy's a bad guy, let's try to catch him. Because his old background was Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. So I started just asking him questions. And I asked him, hey, did you ever speak in tongues? He's like, yeah. I said, you still, and I, I said it in a way where I, I made it seem like speaking in tongues isn't that weird. And I said, do you still speak in tongues from some time to time? He's like, yeah, from time to time I still speak in tongues. <laughs> it's like, there's our proof. We can show the passion. This guy's not saying it. When he's saying he's speaking in tongues, because you're possessed when you're speaking in tongues. Okay? Or unless you're actually speaking with tongues, you're speaking a real language. You're speaking in tongues like the Pentecostals say, you're possessed, according to the Bible. And so this guy ended up being a bad fish. He came to church. And, you know, he ended up being a phony. And so, obviously, we stopped giving him a ride now. And so, the story that I know is somebody that I work with named Joe, who was also a little bit strange, okay? And he was, like, a little bit different. And I felt bad for this guy because everybody at work made fun of him. And so, I was just trying to be a nice person, and I kind of reached out and said, hey, let's have lunch sometime. And so, you know, I had lunch with him, and I gave him the gospel, and he didn't get saved immediately. But that night, supposedly, he got saved. So I don't know, maybe there's a connection there. I don't, I don't want to make too strong of a connection because that's kind of how I got saved. I heard the gospel and then that night I got saved. But with this person, it's the same as this other Joe. And so he calls me that night and he says, hey, you know, I got saved and everything like that. And so, you know, I was around this guy at work all the time. And over the next couple of years, he'd come to church from time to time. But, you know, once again, he was a little bit effeminate. He started to act effeminate and strange. And he had a story that he had been in a car wreck and had, you know, uh, you know, really messed up his brain, so I thought maybe that's why he's kind of kind of weird. But you know, he's kind of effeminate and everything. And, and me and my friends are just like, yeah, there's something off about this guy. And I remember he started to get connected to church, and he got baptized at the church we went to and everything. And he said, yeah, I really want to start getting involved in church. You know, what I really want to help out with is the children's ministry. And so, you know, that night I I uh, called the pastor and just told him, hey, you know, I don't think we can trust this guy. Yet. One thing I forgot to mention. Is like during a time period, he had lived with a gay guy because he said he was trying to save money. But he says there's nothing between us. And I was just like, I don't know, there's too much about this guy. He's kind of weird. And it's like, that's really weird. Right. And so, you know, he was just a little bit effeminate, also named Joe. But what I'm trying to tell you is, you know what, when you go soul winning, there's going to be some bad fish you bring in once. Right. We're happy to have visitors, but, you know, every once in a while, there's going to be some weird people. But that's what happens when you're actually getting good fish. 
See, if you don't cast out your net, you won't get good fish or bad fish. Mm -hmm. But you know what? If you don't cast out your net, you're going to starve to death. And a church that doesn't cast out their net, they're going to starve to death as well. Of course the devil's going to send weird people our way and cause confusion and stuff like that. That's going to happen. But you know what? You have to cast out the net. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what are you doing with your life? And so, yeah, you know, we'll have some bad fish along the way. It doesn't mean we should stop casting out the net. Though. Turn to John 21. Now, I, obviously this is not 100%, but I'll say this, that what I've noticed is when people are kind of new to church, if they get like instantly excited and connected like 100%, sometimes it's kind of like a little bit too much. Like the one that my friend Richie brought, like from day one, he's coming to all the services, he's excited, man, I just want to hear preaching, go soul winning, everything like that. And it's just like, it's, it seemed like too much. Because quite honestly, when you first start living for God, it's not just like you go from here to just like here overnight. Usually it's like a slow, steady climb where someone, they come to, on Sunday once a week from time to time, and they'll miss every once in a while. They slowly start to come to more services, slowly start to come to events, slowly start to get to know people. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, obviously if people jump in right away, that's great. But I will say, I have noticed that sometimes when people come from nothing and jumping in straight away, oftentimes there's something there. They end up being a weird person. But what it says here in John 21, verse 12, is this. And so what I want you to understand here, you say, well, how to encourage a backslidden soul winner? Well, what I want you to realize is that Jesus does not just rip their heads off. Jesus basically just reminds them about the excitement of soul winner. He says, cast in the net. He doesn't just rebuke Peter for being naked out there on the boat. He doesn't just, like, yell at them for being backslidden. What he does is he reminds them about the excitement of soul winner. And so if there is a backslidden soul winner, I believe the best way we can get them excited about the things of God is to try to remind them about the excitement of soul winning. Right. Try to get them back involved in a, in a soul winning event like Bulacan or whatever events we might have going on. But help them be reminded about the excitement. Because all of us can have the excitement kind of wear off because we get used to it. Try to remind them about the excitement. Because nothing is more exciting than soul winning. When your life's really difficult, really tired and stuff, it can fade out very easily. That's the way it works. Verse number 12. Jesus saith unto them, Come and die. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. This is the third time. This is not the first time. It's not the second time. It's the third time. And what that shows you is that if you're backslid, just coming to church one time might not fix everything. Yeah. It's not the first time. It's not the second time. It's the third time. Because as I mentioned, when you backslide down a hill, it is very hard to stop and get your momentum going again. Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, it's frustrating. If you used to be very zealous and you fade out on the things of God, it's going to be hard to be motivated again to get back to where you once were. It's difficult. And look, we're going to have ups and downs in our lives. But I kind of look at backsliding as kind of two things. Basically, short term and long term. Okay, I'm not saying this is necessarily directly what the Bible says. It's just kind of my opinion. You can kind of have short-term backsliding where maybe you're really busy or something. Maybe you kind of fade out of reading the Bible for a little while. That's kind of short-term where basically you're really tired, exhausted. Then there's long-term backsliding where basically you're just slowly just going further down, further down, further down. And, you know, it kind of works both ways. You have both of those things. All of us are going to have short-term backsliding from time to time. We're going to have weeks where we're just not very well spiritually. We're going to have days where we do not feel like coming to church at all. We put on the smile, we put on the barong or whatever, we put on the dress, but we do not feel like being here. We're just, during the sermon, we're just thinking about, oh, I can't wait till it's one o'clock. <laughs> I can get home. It's like, yeah, yeah, you hate the Catholics, big deal, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're all going to have those times. I've had plenty of times I've been in church and I just, just didn't feel like being there. Because the reality is, you know, honestly, there's times you just feel exhausted, you want to rest, you want to relax. It's like that for everybody. But it's very dangerous when you're in a long-term backsliding. Because short-term backsliding will happen to all of us. You go through waves. You go through ups, downs, ups, downs. Even in the Bible, Elijah wishes in himself to die when he gets depressed. This happens. But when you're in a long-term backsliding process, that's difficult to repair and fix. And that is what's going on here. Because they have backslidden on the Lord, and they just cannot get motivated again to live for God. How does Jesus resuscitate them? 
kind of just reminds them about the excitement of solar. Reminds them of what they've left behind if they go back to their old career. It's like, go back to your old career, and you're going to leave behind all this multitude of fish that you can get saved. Notice what it says here in verse number 15. So when they had died, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, this is one of the most debated passages in the entire Bible. Verses 15 through 17. Verse number 17 is one of the most debated verses in the Bible. Because the question is, why does Peter get grieved on the third time? You know, he didn't get grieved on the first time. He wasn't grieved on the second time. Why is it on the third time that he's grieved? Well, let me give you the typical Baptist answer about this, and then I'll give you the biblical answer. Okay? <laughs> this is what the typical Baptist says. Well, if you go back to the original Greek, <laughs> in verse number 15, you know, there's basically agape love and phileo love. Oh. <laughs> and see, I, I could be wrong. I think phileo love's the brotherly love. You know, phileo love, probably it's because, you know, the city of Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. H-I-L, we probably link there with phileo, H-I-L-E-O. But anyways, phileo's like brotherly love. And agape's like this, you know, a much stronger love. I think I got, if those are the words, I think I got them right. That, that phileo love is the brotherly love. And then agape love's like the, you know, much stronger love. And so basically, you know, the first two times, it's just like, it's just a play of love. And then it's like, no big deal. But he's like, oh, how can you, you say that about the agape love? And it really grieves Peter, okay? Now, anyone who says that is basically saying that the King James Bible is not perfect. Right. What's sad is I've heard a lot of King James only people. And honestly, most IFBs will say that. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, well, obviously you don't really believe the King James is perfect because you seem to think there's some hidden meaning in the Greek. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. I believe we don't even know people. we can just read the Bible in English because I believe the King James Bible is perfect. Yep. I believe that, and I'm not, it's not just vain words. I actually believe that. So then you have to ask yourself, why is that true? Well, let me give you two reasons, and the first one's kind of partially why, but the second one is the main reason why. Yep. One reason why you might be grieved is this, because typically when you ask someone a question and they give you the answer, they just give you the answer. You ask them again, they might be kind of annoyed, but then on the third time it's just like, dude, You've already asked me this question. Do you not believe me? Now, I don't think that's the main reason why. I'll tell you the main reason why Peter's grieved. Let me ask you a question. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. So what's happening in the story? Peter has been back sitting for a very long time. And remember how he said, I love you. Lord. I will never deny you because I love you so much. And what is the Lord doing? He's reminding Peter, hey, before you told me you really loved me, and then you denied me three times. And it's not about the love, love. Basically, it's just reminding Peter. Peter's reminded the fact, man, that he did deny him. And he used to be very zealous. He was the most zealous person at that time. And yet at this time, Peter's just a backslidden soul winner. Yeah. Peter, at this moment, during this time period, if he got up to preach a sermon, it wouldn't be that powerful. Now, he's a very powerful preacher. I'm sure he's probably a lot better than me. He probably knew the scriptures a lot better. But at this stage, when you're backslidden, there's going to be no power in your words. Because you're backslidden. So why is it so many pastors and preachers have no power when they speak? Because they're not really serving God. Right. Even if they are saved, if they're not really serving God, they're not going to have much power in your words. And this is the state that Peter's in. He's one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, but you know what? He's backslidden. And when you're backslidden, it's hard to shake you out of this. And so what you notice is that Jesus does not just immediately rebuke Peter. He kind of reminds him about the excitement. And in this kind of in a loving way, he kind of gives him a small rebuke here saying, Hey, you know what? You told me you loved me before. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Yep. What does he say by feed my sheep? Basically, he's talking about believers. There's sheep and there's goats. We as believers, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. What is he telling Peter? I don't want you to be a fisherman anymore. You're too valuable to be a fisherman. You're too good of a preacher. I've given, I specifically chose you. 
It's not like you're just a normal person that got saved. I specifically chose you to be an apostle. Right. I expect you to be a leader. And look, as I said earlier, the Catholics are wrong saying Peter's the first pope. But at this time, Peter really is the main leader. Right. Because once he decides to be backslidden, everybody's backslidden. And so the Lord reminds him, hey, you know what? You're too valuable to be sitting on the sidelines. You're too valuable to be kind of half in and half out. No, I want you to be one of my leaders. That's what the Lord's saying. He needs it. He says, feed my sheep here in verse number 17. Now look at verse number 18. The Bible reads, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt, shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. You say, what, is, what in the world is this talking about? Verse 19, This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. When he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And so in verse 18, isn't it very clear it's talking about Peter basically being martyred? For the cause of Christ. I mean, he says in verse 19, this is what death he should glorify God. That's what the Bible says. Very clear, this is talking about him being martyred. Could we agree on that? Now, I remember somebody who was considered like-minded at one time until he became a heretic. I'm not going to name the name of the sermon. I'll tell you afterwards. But anyways, so he told me this privately. He's like, you know what? I don't think that Peter was martyred. And I'm just like, you don't think Peter was martyred? And it's like, you know, when people say stuff like that, just ridiculous things. Because the Bible literally says in verse 19, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. I mean, isn't that just clear as day? That this is him being martyred, this is how he's dying. And you know, when people say really weird things like that, either they're just trying to be cool and come up with some new theory that will make them look great, or it's because, you know, there's some weirdo, some devil, or whatever. Or both, and usually probably both. But it's just very clear this is how he's martyred. Now, what it doesn't say, though, is it doesn't say he was crucified upside down. Yeah. Now, he might have been. I'm not saying he wasn't crucified upside down. He might have been crucified upside down. But quite honestly, we don't really know about the early apostles, how most of them died, and, and by what way they died. Now, probably most of them were martyred because at this time there was real persecution to serve God. We know Peter was martyred, but we do not know exactly how he died. Was he crucified upside down? You know, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. We don't really know. Okay. And so we don't want to add to the scripture. I mean, it makes your sermon a lot cooler. It makes it a lot more exciting, right? Man, Peter loved the Lord so much. He felt so embarrassed. I can't be crucified. Just right side up. Just crucify me upside down. Because Now, first off, honestly, I don't believe they would honor your request if you said that. If they're going to kill you, they're just going to kill you. They might kill you. Right. If you say, wait, wait, stop. you got to make it upside down. Because I don't want to be crucified the same way as Jesus. Honestly, I, I don't really think they'd honor that request. So honestly, I don't really believe that's how he was crucified. And quite honestly, logically it seems to me like he would die quicker if he were crucified upside down and it wouldn't be as painful. You say, why? Because it's not healthy to be upside down for that long of a period of time. So I don't even know if that would be like a, 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 a more honorable way to die. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say this. Maybe he was crucified upside down. Just we don't know because the Bible doesn't say that. And you know, you never want to add to your sermons and make them more exciting. And honestly, I've heard many preachers that will preach a sermon and they kind of just add little things like that, and you just kind of naturally assume it's in the Bible. Right. Because they preach it as if it's in the Bible. They make it a point to not show you what the Bible's saying, and they preach it as if the Bible specifically says it. And I've heard it in sermons about how Peter was crucified upside down. Well, before you're dogmatic on that, show me some sort of reason to think that. It's certainly not in the Bible, and I don't really think we can trace historical evidence back 2,000 years with much accuracy. And so in verse number verse number 20, the Bible reads, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the, the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast and supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter seeth, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. What is it saying in verse number 22? It's saying that, the Lord's saying to him, if he is still around until I come, you know, what difference does that make to you? Basically, you know, and the next verse kind of clarifies that. Then went the saying and brought among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said, not on me, he shall not die, but if I will, then he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? And so basically the idea, and that's why Peter's asking, because he was going around, it was kind of like a rumor that this man's never going to die. And so, you know, I don't really know why that became a rumor. But then Peter's wondering about, you know, is it true that he's never going to die? 
And then Jesus is saying, well, I mean, if he's still around, what difference does that make to you? What can we learn from that? Well, we don't have to worry about everybody else's life. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter what so-and-so is going to do. Just, you know, worry about your own self. Now, he just told you, you know, how you're going to die. He told you about your life. You don't have to know about everybody else's life. Now, quite honestly, the Lord doesn't tell us what our next steps are. Okay. But, you know, here with Peter, he does know that. Verse number 24, this is that disciple which testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, with which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And so if every single thing was written about Jesus Christ, everything that he said, the Bible says that, you know what, we wouldn't even be able to contain all the books that he did so many things. Now, we have a little bit of extra time, so I want you to go back to Exodus 34. I'm going to go to the passage that I was referencing earlier to give you more insight about climbing a mountain, and I'll explain it real quick. It's kind of a mini-sermon, because I realized my sermon was a little bit too short tonight. i got to hit that magic 40-minute mark. I'm not sure if I'm there, so... can't do anything on short chapters. But I want to show you in Exodus 34. I've actually preached a full sermon on this before. It's a really interesting passage, especially when you notice certain things in here. There's a lot of symbolism here in the Old Testament. But what I want you to notice here in verse number 1 is the Bible reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. Now write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. So if you remember two chapters earlier, when they're worshiping the golden calf, Moses comes down from the mountain and he's free angry. Destroys the Ten Commandments. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning on Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mountain, neither let the flocks nor herds be before that mountain. And so I want you to notice that the instructions God gives to Moses are actually pretty simple instructions. He tells him exactly what I want to take place. Okay? This is the way it works in the Christian life. The Christian life is not some complicated maze that you got to figure out. Man, I don't know what to do. Man, does God want me to read the Bible? I just don't know. I don't want to do it if God doesn't want me to do it. I mean, we know we're supposed to read the Bible. We know we're supposed to pray. We know we're supposed to go to church. We know we're supposed to go home. It's not complicated to figure out what we need to do, but you have to keep in mind at this time, how old was Moses when he started his ministry? 80 years old. Right? His life was in the stages of 40, and he's 80 years old, and let me ask you a question. Is it easy to climb a mountain? No. It's not easy when you're in your 30s, much less when you're 80 years old. You say, well, people live to be 900 years old. No, they didn't at this time. Because Moses said that basically you live three score, 10 years. And if by strength it's, it's four score, then, you know, even the better, right? 70 to 80 years is what he said. And he starts his ministry at 80 years old. He dies at 120. His, his older brother actually outlives him. He dies at 123 there. But... Moses is not a young man at this time. Now, it's not easy to climb a mountain, but it's not easy to climb a mountain with tablets in your hands either. Okay? And so it's very difficult what he's doing. He's actually in pretty good shape, we can presume from this. But go to the end of the chapter. And I want you to notice that he's with the Lord for 40 days. And I want you to see the reaction here. And let's look. Verse number, verse number 29. Let's look at verse number 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked to him. What is it saying in verse 29? When it says he wist not, basically he is not aware that the skin of his face shone. His skin literally was basically shining bright. Literally, he physically was changed after being close to the Lord. Okay? The reason why this is in the Bible is because it's giving us symbolism. Verse 31, And Moses called on to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation were turned on to him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children... Actually, look at verse 30. I skipped it. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. So basically, Moses is with the Lord for 40 days, and the result is his skin actually changes, and everybody else is afraid to be around him. What does that teach you? Well, it teaches you when you get close to the Lord, all the people that you used to know... They think you're kind of different. Right. All your, your your old friends before you went soul winning, and they were good friends. Now that you're going soul winning, they, they, they're they afraid to come nigh you. Yeah. They, they think you're weird. See, when it comes to separating from your friends, look, you really don't have to separate from your friends. If you're serving God, they separate from you. Yeah. That's the way it works. And so he's there for 40 days and 40 nights, and guess what? He's changed, and all his friends are God. What that shows you is that 
you know, if you use the analogy of a mountain, he basically is climbing the mountain, he's given very simple instructions, and he gets close to God, and he changes. And so the, the idea of basically climbing a mountain to get close to God is something that is in the Bible, it is a biblical concept. And, you know, honestly, going back to that point, though, we are all going to have stages in our life where we're struggling. You're short-term backsliding, and you know what, that's okay. You're busy, you're scheduled, you know, you didn't get much Bible reading in. But, you know, long-term, you've got to find a way to shake that out of yourself. You've got to find a way to get back the excitement and the joy of living for God. Because if you're not excited about going soul winning, you're only going to go through the motions for so long. Right. You must find a way to actually enjoy going out there. Give me people say, remember the excitement and the joy of soul. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here in your house. And we ask you to just uh, help us to apply these words to our lives, God. Help us in this room to stay faithful to you.